Hi, good afternoon. Um, welcome to what is, I think, my seventh time sitting in on a technology, society, and public policy lecture at Rice. Uh, this is a series that predates my, in my time here at Rice by a few years. Um, last couple of years, we've had uh, some pretty interesting speakers. Uh, last year, we had Alec Ross, who was Hillary Clinton's internet advisor. Um, and the year before that, we had, who did we have the year before that? Oh, anyway, um, so uh, we always try to bring together something that combines a technology that's emerging or is on our minds with uh, some sort of computational issue um, and you know, the ramifications for public policy. Uh, John Villasenor's lecture today is no different. This is a lecture on, on that merging of technology and policy that policymakers oftentimes have such a hard time dealing with. You know, the topic today is something that we call by a lot of names, uh, remotely piloted vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles, remote controlled aircraft, unmanned aerial systems. In the media, we see these uh, kind of hard terms repeated often, predator, reaper, this idea of these clinically clean uh, military systems flown from a distance. But we decided we'd talk about drones and drones here in the United States. So that's a predator, it's not armed. Uh, they fly over the United States from time to time. Um, the drones topic has been on a lot of people's minds, uh, Amazon.com being the most recent uh, idea that has made drones something people think about, uh, the idea that that package that you deliver on the web isn't delivered quite quickly enough by by the parcel service you select, but rather that it needs to be delivered immediately by an autonomous vehicle to your house. Um, on Houston, drones are something that are a part of our community. Uh, we uh, are a registered site for drone operations through the Houston Police Department. Um, Ellington Field, which is the Air National Guard station that used to be Ellington Air Force Base, uh, is a drone operations station. Uh, there are people there today flying operational missions over conflict zones around the world. Uh, and they go home every night to nice suburban houses in Houston like you and me. Um, the other area where drones we get a lot of talk about in, in our region is the border. Uh, John will probably touch on this a bit. and We've had some questions about this. Let me introduce him. Uh, in addition to being a wonderful collaborator, and John and I wrote a paper together, which John principally wrote, and my other colleague Cody Monk wrote a couple years ago on Bitcoin, uh, uh, which is the uh, electronic currency that is being widely traded. Uh, John is quite a futurist, uh, I'll just say that. He is also a professor of electrical engineering and public policy at the University of California at Los Angeles. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. He is vice chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on intellectual property, the Intellectual Property System. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and an affiliate of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. And he works much like I do on the intersection of technology, policy, and law. So with that brief introduction, I will turn it over to John Villasenor. And he has offered to take questions, and uh, John is a Stanfordite. There are many Stanford people in the room. I guess when a Stanford person shows up, other Stanford people show up. And I got my Stanford University Press booklet today uh, on drones, so John might, might, might follow up with the press on that. Anyway, hi everybody. Thank you very much for um, taking uh, time out of what I'm sure is a very busy schedule for all of you. Um, so I'm gonna talk about drones in the United States, um, uh, aiming uh, for sort of a maybe 45, 50 minute talk and then questions, but I also uh, encourage and I'm happy to take any questions at any time that anyone has uh, during, during the discussion. Um, so, and again, as, as I discussed a moment ago, we're gonna be focusing on their use in the, in the United States. So let me start by talking about uh, what, is, what is a drone. Um, in the years before, leading up to and during World War II, a drone was often used uh, to, for a term. What happened is uh, militaries, like the United States and, and in the UK, would refit regular airplanes so they could be controlled remotely and then used for anti-aircraft gunners to practice shooting down so you obviously wouldn't be shooting down a person, uh, plane with a person in it. And that's when the, the term drone um, first got to be used. Today that's often used for almost any unmanned aircraft and Chris alluded to some, some of the other terms that are used. Sometimes you see UAV, remotely piloted aircraft, uh, or unmanned aircraft system. So I'll, I'll be generally using unmanned aircraft, but I'll, I'll sometimes 
uh, use uh, drones as well. In terms of historical context, uh, unmanned aviation actually predates manned flight. Uh, in the decades prior to the Wright brothers' initial flight demonstration uh, of you know, sustained, heavier-than-air powered flight, in the decades prior to that, there were many people doing research uh, in what we would now call drones, basically methods for keeping things using propulsion systems, uh, very primitive by our standards, but for keeping things in the air. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, they were used for target practice, anti-aircraft gunning practice in the early 20th century. <laughs> In the 1950s and 60s, the United States used unmanned aircraft for reconnaissance uh, in places like uh, Vietnam. Uh, and by the 1970s and 80s, uh, there were many places, United States, Canada, Israel, what was then the USSR, and multiple European countries had programs. But the last, let's call it 10 to 15 years, we've had just an enormous acceleration of growth in this industry uh, for um, a couple of reasons. So even though this goes back really a century almost, or more in some ways, um, well, what has changed? There's been a couple of drivers. Well, first of all, the global positioning system. Now, the GPS system, the satellites aren't new. They've been up there for many decades. But what is newer is the ability to have GPS receivers that are integrated into very small single chips, basically. That makes it possible to have uh, these platforms that can have GPS location capability without having them be very large. Low cost, small form factor imaging technology. So everybody here is probably carrying some sort of a mobile phone or a tablet or a laptop. The enormous global demand for those devices is what has made, there's been an incredible investment in cameras, little cameras that go into smartphones. And that investment also has then benefited unmanned aircraft because these same low cost, lightweight imaging you know, capabilities can be put in unmanned aircraft. Communications technology, as everyone in this room knows, has advanced just dramatically in the last couple of decades. And also, there's been some really interesting advances in airframe design and flight control. So you put all those things together, and what we've seen is this incredible upswing since, you can pick your year, but in the last decade and a half or so in, in the technology for unmanned aircraft. And that then has led to many of the other broader questions that have, have grown up with that that we're going to be talking about um, today. I should also emphasize, even though I'm focusing on the United States, that we're, this is a global market. The United States does not have anywhere near a monopoly on unmanned aircraft. Uh, I'm not going to read this uh, verbatim, but basically there are estimates of spending approaching $100 billion globally on unmanned aircraft over the next decade. And much of that spending will not be in the United States. If I were to list all the countries where there's active unmanned aircraft programs, you'd fall asleep while I, made, I ran through the list. But some of the countries here, I'm, again, I won't read this list, um, are up here, but uh, you know, the folks that you'd expect, as, as well as some folks that, that you, you might not expect. So this is a global industry with dozens of countries. The United States is certainly a technology leader in this area, but, but, but not at all uh, the only country uh, doing this. I'm going to give a sort of a show and tell of some examples. Um, this is a Global Hawk. Uh, this is one of the larger platforms. It's used um, uh, primarily uh, by the US military. This, the Global Hawks can fly for, they have a range of about 8,700 nautical miles. That's a really, really long distance. Uh, they can fly up to nearly 60,000 feet. So it's a, so in this, the, you can see the size of this. This is really the size, uh, really a, 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 really a small business jet. Uh, so it's, it's quite a large uh, platform. On the other end of the size scale, people seen these maybe, if they go to Brookstone, right? This is a, a Parrot AR. Uh, drone, so you can buy this in Brookstone or on the internet for a couple of hundred dollars. They're video video enabled. And this is one flying, uh, flying over over the desert somewhere. This just weighs weighs almost weighs almost nothing. Um, this is a uh, a drone or an unmanned aircraft called a Scout. It's got a little camera. You can see right here. It's got four rotors. Oh, by the way, these these sometimes this this one I just showed you. There's four rotors here. These are called quadcopters because they've got four rotors. Uh, and that turns out to ha having four rotors turn turns out to make it easier to fly these things. So this uh, one right here is another quadcopter stru structure. Uh, this uh, got some uh, uh, some mention in the press back in uh, 2011. When you remember, that's when Libya uh, had their uh, their revolution, basically, and the, the Libyan rebels during the summer of 2011. Uh, were, among other things, using this to see, to get a view of, of where uh, Qaddafi's uh, forces were. This is something called the Zephyr. Um, it's solar powered. Um, so this is, you can see these, you know, these wingspan over 70 feet, but it weighs about 120 pounds. And on the, on the top of this is a bunch of solar panels. And what happens is the solar panels obviously collect you know, energy from the sun. They use that to both charge a battery and to turn a propeller. And then the bat when at night, then the, the battery is used to continue to power this. 
This stayed aloft for um, about two weeks in a 2000 test over Arizona. It's a long time to have an have a airplane of any kind up, up in the air. Anyone heard of a Solar Eagle? It's a fascinating platform. It's under development by Boeing. Uh, it's a DARPA-funded project. Um, it's expected to be able to capable, expected to be capable of staying aloft for, take a guess, how long do you think this thing will stay up for? Any guesses? Six months. Longer than six months. Forever. Not forever, shorter than forever. <laughs> five years. Um, five continuous years in the stratosphere, just turning slow circles in the sky. So um, absolutely stunning. I mean, who could have imagined, right, that you could have an aircraft that could stay up for five years? But it's going to be, it's going to happen. And, and, you know, the gentleman who said forever, you know, forever is a long time, but, but something that could stay up for five years, you know, how much harder would it be to make it stay up for eight years or ten years? Uh, so you can have this, the, the concept of something basically parked in the stratosphere, and, and obviously there are lots of, of, of questions that arise when you can do that. Um, a, there's, uh, on the small end, talk about the small end. So there's a, 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 there is a company called AeroVironment, um, which, uh, which does a lot, of, uh, a lot of work in the unmanned aircraft uh, industry. I'll show a, a short video in just a second of, of one of these, but they developed something called the Nano Hummingbird, which weighs two-thirds of an ounce. Okay, so at the other end of the, the size spectrum, you know, the global hawk weighs you know, thousands of pounds, two-thirds of an ounce, and they successfully demonstrated a prototype in 2011. Two-thirds of an ounce is really light, right? It's really light, but you can get even lighter. Um, there's something called a RoboBee, which was a flight announced uh, less than a year ago by some researchers at Harvard. It weighs less than, you're not going to believe it. How, how small do you think? How much, what fraction of an ounce? One three hundredth, one three hundredth of an ounce. Okay. To be fair, powered externally by electricity, delivered through a thin wire attached to an external power source. But one three hundredth of an ounce. That means that in your hand you could hold. I think the math is about a little less than five thousand of them. Would be weigh a pound, right? That's just an amazing. So, so these are you know drones, right? Covers this incredible menagerie of things, which you know once you're freed from the need to put a person in a flying you know, in an aircraft, then all of a sudden there's a far greater range of things that you can do in terms of size and shapes and endurances and, and, and so on. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention before I show some sort of videos and then we'll go on to the, the, the rest of the presentation here is uh, something called Argus. Argus is not an unmanned aircraft at all. It's just an imaging system. But it's an imaging system that is put on or can be put on an un unmanned aircraft. And what it does is it, it combines data from hundreds of cameras, literally just hundreds on the bottom of this thing. And it, forms a giant, um, giant mosaic here. So let me um, take, a, take a brief uh, side tour here, and I'm going to uh, sh show you a couple of really, really interesting. Um, so, so this illustrates you know, this, this incredible complexity in terms of the variety of the platforms, what they can do, and obviously the issues and the questions that they raise um, from a public policy standpoint. I don't know what happened to my, um, gosh, I got to. Let me just scroll down to this thing here. OK, so here we go. OK, so just a little, so what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about um, privacy, how that's impacted, because obviously there's a question that, that's raised, um, and then regulation and some safety things, and, and that'll be it. So just a, um, just a little kind of primer. People say drones, and, and it, it evokes this image of this automated thing you know, flying by itself with no human anywhere in sight. And that's possible, but it's not usually the typical case. So who controls an unmanned aircraft? Well, a person, um, an onboard autopilot, or both. And that is the same as manned aircraft, right? When you are flying on a United aircraft, you know, to San Francisco or whatever, then that, that is being controlled by typically a person in the cockpit. But sometimes there are moments during that flight where it will be controlled by an autopilot, right? Because the pilots aren't literally hands on the, you know, the stick the whole time. Um, and so the key difference then is whether the person, when the person is in control, whether that person is on board uh, the aircraft or not. Obviously, in an unmanned aircraft, that is not the case. And what we call a first person view system, right? So I could, I could pilot, a, I could go to a kid's a toy store and buy a remote control toy helicopter. I'd be watching the helicopter and flying it, right? It's also possible to have a camera in, the, in, in a more sophisticated platform, and I'm watching a computer screen seeing what I would see if I were in it, and that's called a first person view uh, system. Fully autonomous flight is unusual and very unlikely to be allowed by the FAA. So 
there's a lot of press that was generated when Jeff Bezos said, hey, we're going to start delivering packages with drones. Um, you know, uh, he's a very smart person. I'm sure he is smart enough to know that it is very unlikely that the FAA would actually allow that for all sorts of reasons. If you, it sounds neat, but imagine automatic, autonomously trying to lower a drone through the telephone wires and leaves in front of a house and drop a package off. And it, it's, it's, so it's unlikely to happen uh, in, in the near future. However, autonomous flight has lots of other uh, places where it is used. I mean, for example, example, there are areas in the Arctic where people have talked about having researchers you know, do autonomous uh, flight there. Um, for domestic unmanned aircraft applications, actually, I'm going to ask for suggestions. What can, you know, putting aside the military applications, because that's, that's not what this talk is about. In the United States, for domestic applications, what are some of the things we can use unmanned aircraft for? Ideas. <coughs> I'm sorry? Agriculture is a great answer, yes. In fact, in Japan, where it's already lawful to do commercial unmanned aircraft, I've, I've heard that about 30% of crop spraying is done by remote control uh, um, platforms. What else? Exploration, or develop, oil field development. Anything else? Mining. Sorry? Pipeline. Pipeline, inspections, that's right, absolutely. Anything else? Sports, pe pe yeah, people, have, yeah, that's right, they did sports photography, yeah. Search and rescue is a really important one, right? Anything else? So you could, so you could, right? Just for my basically getting for for purposes of security for monitoring a, a critical infrastructure type stuff. Absolutely. So there's a, there's a long, long list. I'll, I'll put here's here's my list. You, you've had a lot of them. Disaster response, right? Is another one we didn't talk about. Wildfire spotting, you know, you can imagine like after a wildfire you might want to, or during a wildfire you can help fight it, but after it you might want to fly over with a thermal imager and identify some hot spots. Inspection of large or remote structures we had. Scientific research, um, NASA has used unmanned aircraft to fly over active volcanoes and get, you know, air samples, something you wouldn't want to do in a helicopter. Um, it's also, we were talking, uh, the, there's, um, for example, right now people know people fly into hurricanes, these, these storm chasers, uh, and th that gets amazing information, but those planes are, are, have limited duration, and also, you know, th th this ideally you'd rather not fly into a hurricane if you could choose not to, and so uh, unmanned aircraft could use that. You could also think of, man of manufacturing small little unmanned aircraft intended to be destroyed, but you could fly them into tornadoes, right? And in the time before they were destroyed, they could transmit information. Right now, we've never, we've never actually measured the dynamics of wind inside tornadoes, except for you know, isolated on the ground stations. Uh, you have an amazing amount of information you can gather. News reporting uh, and traffic monitoring, there's a lot of interest for, from people who want to you know, use this for news reporting. Law enforcement, um, there's various applications there. Use by civil liberties groups and activists. I'll give some examples later on. They might want to film a, a protest. Uh, yeah, that they're kind of commercial imaging, you know, things like real estate, um, surveying. So there's a long, long list of applications, uh, and we could go on. Um, many, many applications here. Um, so I'm going to talk about privacy because that's the the issue that probably most animates people when this topic comes up is privacy. And it's a legitimate cop topic. It's a legitimate thing to talk about. So at the risk of, 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 of kind of boring people, I want to step back a little bit and, and sort of talk about, because if you're going to have a discussion about privacy, you need to do it so with context for kind of what the privacy protections are. So a, a brief detour, just so we're all on the same page, that in this country we actually have a lot of uh, frameworks for privacy. Um, we have privacy from con the Constitution, we have it from statutes, and we have it from common law. I'll briefly mention each of these. Privacy is not explicitly mentioned uh, in the Declaration of Independence uh, or the Constitution. Um, however, the concepts of, of liberty and freedom in those documents are closely tied to privacy. And so, as everyone knows, uh, I'm sure in this room, we have things like the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment. Uh, and uh, the, fourth, the First Amendment, which have direct ties uh, to, uh, to privacy. There's also uh, statutory. So statutory law is laws that are enacted by a legislator, a legislative body, be it federal or state. Uh, so there's lots of statutory privacy protections out there. At the federal level, uh, people have heard of probably HIPAA. Um, at, at the state level, there's, there's lots of laws relating to banks and libraries and medical records and credit card information and whether you're allowed to record a conversation in a room whether with getting before you've gotten permission from everyone in it, all that kind of thing. There's a lot of these statutory privacy protections. Uh, and then there's something called common law. Um, and common law is the body of previous judicial decisions. 
And that also provides a lot of privacy protection. In particular, uh, there's a privacy tort called invasion of privacy, which I'm sure everyone here has heard of. But from a legal standpoint, invasion of privacy has four subcategories. And I won't read them all, except I will notice, note that the first two, intrusion upon seclusion and public disclosure of private facts, are the ones that would most likely be implicated if somebody were to, uh, if a private party were to operate an unmanned aircraft in a way that violated privacy. So with that background, that's kind of the, you know, the, the background here. Let me give some examples of, of, of you know, uh, how this applies. So the first, when you're talking about privacy, the first kind of partition you need to talk about is whether the, uh, the party who might be violating privacy is the government or not, because the legal frameworks are very different. Um, I think, as probably everybody in this, in this room knows, um, when it's the government which is taking the action, it's the Fourth Amendment which is the primary privacy protection in terms of unreasonable, you know, forbidding unreasonable ser searches and seizures. Um, but uh, if it's a private party, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. So if while you're watching me give this talk, your seatmate, who you, the person you're sitting next to, who you don't know, starts rummaging through your smartphone, which you've left sitting on the ground next to you, you can get mad at them, but you can't legitimately claim that they've violated your Fourth Amendment rights, right? They haven't, because they violated other things, but not your Fourth Amendment rights, because they're not constrained by the Fourth Amendment. So when a private party engages in an action, and the question of whether that violates privacy involves typically the tension between the First Amendment, right? The First Amendment confers on us a, a, a freedom to gather information, right? Does that freedom extend so far as the ability to you know, put a ladder up into somebody's house that you don't know and climb up and look in their second floor window? Of course not, right? So that freedom of inform to gather information is, is constrained by common law invasion of privacy statutes, so, and sometimes statutory restrictions. So those, so those are the two separate frameworks that apply when we're talking about unmanned aircraft. And the first question you have to ask if you want to say, OK, what, what, count, what, uh, what measures can we employ to stop privacy violations? The next question you should ask is, well, who is operating the unmanned aircraft? And then based on that answer, you can then proceed further. So, um, I'll start by talking about privacy from government unmanned aircraft. The Fourth Amendment is the key framework, as we all know. Um, and of course, it won't surprise you that there has never been a significant unmanned aircraft government privacy case in the courts, and certainly not at the Supreme Court. Um, but there's a, a couple of highly relevant Supreme Court decisions, not related to unmanned aircraft, but they're still highly, highly relevant. And they all are, are, are key to a reasonable expectation of privacy. In other words, whether the Fourth Amendment has been violated when the government gathers information without a warrant is, tar is tied to what your reasonable expectation of privacy. So the first case I'll talk about, I'll talk about two or three cases. California v. Sierra Ola, this is 1986. What happened was police in Santa Clara got a tip that somebody was growing marijuana in their backyard. And they went by the house, and they found that they, they drove around it, but there was a fence around the backyard. They couldn't see into the backyard. So what they did is, without, a, without getting a warrant, they got a private plane, not an unmanned aircraft, just a regular you know, single-engine private plane, and they flew over the house at flying in a lawful manner. They weren't violating FAA regulations. And then they had a police officer who was trained in recognizing marijuana plants and looked down and said, hey, this guy's growing marijuana plants. Based on that information, they then got a warrant. They found that, that he was actually uh, engaged in growing marijuana, and the person was arrested. So this was, went to the courts. This went all the way up to the Supreme Court, which found that there was no Fourth Amendment violation. Okay? He had challenged it on those grounds, but it found that there was no Fourth Amendment violation. And what the court said, the Supreme Court, was that the Fourth Amendment protection has never been extended to require law enforcement officers to shield their eyes when passing by a home on public thoroughfares. Right? So if, for, if someone was growing marijuana on their front lawn without a fence, and a police officer walked by and said, hey, that's marijuana. Right? The person couldn't say, oh, you violated my Fourth Amendment rights by looking. Right? You, you couldn't say that. Okay? So, so that's one of the things that the court, the court said. The court also said that the observations took place within public navigable airspace. Okay? in a physically non-intrusive manner. We'll come back to public navigable airspace in just a minute. It's a really interesting question. But under that, for, for in this case, there's no dispute that the, the airplane was in public navigable airspace. Uh, and you know, the, the, the fact that the observation was directed to find that marijuana, marijuana plants was, was irrelevant. The court also noted, although I didn't have it here, the same observation could have been made had the police officer driven by riding in a truck that was high enough off the ground to see over, over the fence. Okay, so. And then finally, the court said, in an age where private and commercial flight in public airways is routine, it's unreasonable for the respondent to expect that his marijuana plants were constitutionally protected from being observed with the naked eye. Key phrase there, the naked eye. Because you could argue then 
to the extent to which the extent to which that maps into unmanned aircraft may be different because they don't have the naked eye. The Fourth Amendment simply does not require police traveling in the public airways at this altitude to obtain a warrant to observe in order to observe what is visible to the naked eye. So really important uh, precedent. And you can argue it both ways. The people who, if you, the, the, the pessimistic view of that precedent is it's bad for unmanned aircraft privacy because it said, hey, no Fourth Amendment violation. The optimistic view is, well, you could say, well, no, that precedent applied only to naked eye observations, and it's a different ballgame if you've got, if you've got uh, cameras in there. Similar situation, 1989, uh, police received a tip that somebody was growing marijuana in a greenhouse in back of their house. Uh, the backyard in the previous case and the greenhouse are both what's called the curtilage of a home, which is afforded the same legal protection under the Fourth Amendment as, as the home itself. Um, so they got a helicopter 400 feet up. They looked. They could see into the slack openings in the greenhouse found, hey, there's marijuana in there. Again, this went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court, again, held these observations to be constitutional. Um, there wasn't a majority opinion, but a majority of the justices found them to be constitutional. So again, uh, very similar to the uh, earlier case. The, the final case I'll mention is something called Kylo. This is a really interesting case that has nothing to do with aircraft. What happened here was police received a tip, again, that somebody was growing marijuana. Um, and what they did is they used thermal imaging in a car, not an aircraft, to drive down the street. And with the thermal imager, they were able to, to show that the walls of this guy's house were warmer than everybody else's walls. Okay? And they, from that, they inferred that he had heat lamps inside and he was growing marijuana. And this got uh, challenged and went to the, uh, and the person was arrested. Uh, and this time, this went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court found against the government. They found that this person's Fourth Amendment rights had been violated. Okay? What they said was, whereas here the government uses a device that is not in general public use to explore the details of the home, the details of a home that would previously have been unknowable without physical intr intrusion, the surveillance is a search and is presumptively unreasonable without a warrant. So this is a case where it went against the government. Interestingly, in the dissent in this, this was the majority opinion, one of the dissenting justices wrote, well, you know, it's a strange, it's a strange rule because would it have been unlawful if the police noticed that the snow on his house's roof melted faster than on the other house's roofs? You know, you could argue that. So, so this idea of, you know, if you start putting, you know, restrictions on inferring information about inside from outside observations, there's some really complicated questions that, that go on. So in sum, so, the, so how do we map these into unmanned aircraft? Well, the, you know, the, the rulings directly related to aerial observations of what we call curtilage, a home and its immediate, immediate surroundings. Um, they found, the, the two we mentioned, they found, North, uh, they found no Fourth Amendment violation, but they're narrow in scope. They're restricted to naked eye observations, or at least that's what I would argue if I were on the other side of this, uh, and they involve public navigable airspace. Okay? So one of the immediate questions this raises with unmanned aircraft is what is public navigable airspace? Right? What, and there's a really interesting um, question that, that arises. Um, we would all agree that, that Air, a thousand feet above, well actually it used to be under, under common law in the pre-flight days when you owned property, you owned the column forever. Okay? Now when airplanes started coming along, then obviously that became uh, an issue. right? You, you, it would be nice perhaps if you happened to live on the approach path to Hobby Airport, if you could charge every United, you know, you know, time a United flight flies over your house or Southwest, you could charge thousand dollars toll, right? That would be kind of a convenient way to earn in income, but it, it wouldn't work. They wouldn't pay. And it turns out that in 1946 there was a, a chicken farmer, um, and uh, his chickens were or were in a, in the approach path of an airport, and the chickens, I guess, the noise was scaring them. They died, and so he. He filed a complaint, and the, in a case called Cosby, C-A-U-S-B-Y, the Supreme Court basically said that the airways are a public, public resource. Um, and, but but the, the didn't, they didn't need to, re to resolve how, how low is the airspace, right? So you can't stop Southwest from flying over your house at 1,000 feet on the way to Hobby Airport. But you should be able to stop your neighbor if your neighbor is a nuisance and wants to fly a little unmanned aircraft around your backyard 18 inches above the ground, right? It would be ridiculous if your neighbor were to say, well, hey, that's public airspace. I can fly around your backyard if I want. You know, and if you said, I'm going to whack it with a stick, if you said, no, you can't do that. That's public airspace. That would be ridiculous, right? So, so clearly, you have a right to control the airspace 18 inches above the ground. Clearly, you don't have a right to control it 1,000 feet above the ground. So what, where does that boundary, where does the airspace stop being yours and start being public? It's a really interesting and really unresolved question. So with those caveats, there has been no Fourth Amendment violation in, in those cases. Um, 
the Kylo rule, people often talk, look, look at this Kylo rule, and they say, well, the Supreme Court said that if a device is not in general public use, its use to infer interior of a home violates the Fourth Amendment. It doesn't, some people say, oh my gosh, that means when unmanned aircraft are in common use, then you can use them for any of this stuff. But it didn't say that, right? It didn't go that far. The Supreme Court was silent on what happens when a technology becomes commonly used, which is what's going to happen to unmanned aircraft. Um, so, and what the court has never really looked at is long-term surveillance, like that Argus system we, we just saw an example of. Like, if you were to take an Argus system and put it up, you know, park it over a city, and then have the government have access to sort of follow all your travels around, what would that mean in terms of your, of your Fourth Amendment rights? Um, it would certainly be a concern, but it's not one that the Supreme Court has addressed. The, the most recent case the Supreme Court to address long-term surveillance was something called Jones two years ago, and they sidestepped that question uh, about whether long-term surveillance was a Fourth Amendment uh, vi violation. So that's the government situation. So sort of open, right? You can kind of see the glass half full or glass empty to, depending on you know, whether you're somebody who wants to fight for your privacy or whether you want to use these to, to, uh, to provide observations. From non-government entities, right? Not, so not law enforcement, not police agencies, not you know, the, the US Department of Agriculture or anything else or the Environmental Protection Agency, any non-government ent ent entity as I mentioned before, the privacy question is the tension between the First Amendment and invasion of privacy statutes. Um, these limits have not been tested with respect to unmanned aircraft, at least as far as I'm aware, uh, uh, far aware of. The reasonable expectation of privacy is still a primary consideration. The standard to show invasion of privacy can be incredibly high. Okay? Um, for, I'll give an example. Um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the Snyder v. Phelps decision. This is the case where this, uh, I'll just, this odious group, this Westboro Baptist Church, would picket f soldiers of, uh, f funerals of soldiers. And so somebody filed a legal complaint against them, and that went up to the Supreme Court, which, which uh, found that their actions did not constitute an invasion of privacy, odious and, uh, and aberrant as, as, as they were. So that was, I, I mentioned that just to show that sometimes this, the standards can be very, very, it can be very, very hard to get a showing of an invasion of privacy. Um, that said, you can certainly imagine cases, you know, somebody takes an unmanned aircraft, like a little one, and flies it into a fenced-in backyard and flies it just outside the bedroom window of somebody and films into the window. I think there's a really strong case that, that would be an invasion of privacy under any reasonable interpretation. And so that would be a case where, almost certainly, if the operator said, hey, I've got a First Amendment right to do that, the answer would be, well, that's ridiculous. You don't have a First Amendment right to do that. So that's the tension uh, that's, that's, at, uh, that's at play. Um, Let's see, what else can I say here? Oh, I'll also mention a really interesting uh, issue with business privacy. So, um, and, you know, the, the, as everyone knows, there's a hotly contested set of a portion of the law, which is to what extent are corporations people, right? And to what extent do they have the same rights as people? There's a case to be heard, uh, I think, next week uh, about in the Supreme Court on that, and there was the Citizens United ruling a couple of years ago on that. So that complex, thorny issue also um, impacts unmanned aircraft. To what extent do businesses have rights to privacy from uh, aerial observations? And what happens if private groups use unmanned aircraft to conduct an inspection of a facility and then report the results to the government? That has happened, uh, and also to what extent do companies have a right to protect trade secrets right, uh, from imagery or other forms of observation using unmanned aircraft? So the idea of somebody actually con conducting a kind of um, unsanctioned overflight has happened here in Texas. Um, in 2011, as a Texas man, he flew an unmanned aircraft over land near a Dallas area meatpacking plant, uh, and he found what appeared to be environmental violations, and he contacted the Coast Guard, um, and in early 2012, there was a search warrant served on the property, and investigators found, a, found problems, right? And so this is a really interesting set of questions. You know, the, the ability to, of, of private citizens or groups to conduct overflights, right, and then to provide the results of those overflights to government agencies, it raises a bunch of issues. Um, you know, on the one hand, you know, you can argue that, you know, to the extent that such overflights are lawfully conducted and, and reveal information that is uh, potentially endangering public health, that's potentially valuable. On the other hand, you can also identify a bunch of you know, scenarios where it's quite problematic. Suppose you have a, a well-meaning but 
uh, misguided environmental group that flies over a facility and reports violations that actually aren't violations, right? But it costs them lots of time and money. Government inspectors come in, they've got to explain, no, this is out there. And the government inspectors say, oh, no, that's okay. It's, you're not violating anything. So if the environmental group does that on a continuing basis, is that, is that you know, a, fair, a fair outcome? So a lot of interesting questions there. So let me move on to um, talk a little bit about the regulatory environment because that, there's, there's two reasons why people are so interested in unmanned aircraft these days. One is the technology has changed so much in the last 10 years. And the second thing is the regulatory environment has changed and is changing. Um, to talk about that, I have to sort of, you know, sort of make an initial uh, explanation that from the FAA standpoint, the Federal Aviation Administration standpoint, um, aircraft are either public or civil. Okay. A public aircraft is one that is operated by a public entity, like you know, a government agency. And a civil aircraft are operated by private companies. And it's a little bit, it's, it's not the actual airplane that you can knock on and say this airplane is a public or civil aircraft. It's actually how, it use, how it's used. So for example, when the government charters a private airplane to fly government officials, a group of government officials, to some place, at that moment, during its flight, that is a public aircraft, even though that same aircraft may be a private aircraft if it's chartered by a sports team a week and a half later. And that distinction is really important because the rules, just like the, the constitutional privacy frameworks are very different for public versus non-public uh, actors, the rules relating to flight and unmanned aircraft are different in terms of the regulations. So, so the, the enormous upswing in interest in unmanned aircraft was really kind of kicked into high gear or kicked off in um, 2012, two years ago, a little over two years ago, um, Congress passed and, and the President signed uh, something called the FAA Modernization and Reform Act of, of 2012, which is, you know, like a lot of the legislation, it was a big, long thing. But in it, there were about six pages specifically for unmanned aircraft. And that legislation, which, you know, has now become law, it provided a set of overlapping deadlines to integrate unmanned aircraft into the national airspace by late 2015. So we are now sort of roughly, a little more than halfway through that process. Um, and so um, what it did is basically, um, let me, oops, I thought I had some deadlines here. But so basically it has some tiered deadlines. Since, since May of last year, law enforcement has had the ability to get expedited licenses for certain less than 25 pounds uh, unmanned aircraft flown within line of sight in daylight, less than 400 feet. And then rules are due uh, later this year for, uh, for, for commercial unmanned aircraft. Uh, use and then by the end of for small of small unmanned aircraft and by the end by late 2015, in theory, we'll have rules for both uh, civil and public unmanned aircraft use. Now that said, deadlines uh, deadlines set by Congress are important. But if there's one agency of the U.S. government which has a little bit of flexibility in pushing the pack, it's the FAA, right? Because really, what is Congress going to say if the FAA says, "Listen, I know you told me to do this by you know August 2014." But I, I can't do it safely by then. Is Congress going to say, do it anyway? Of course not, right? So there's some chance, in fact, these, these deadlines have already slipped a bit. So whether we're really going to hit the 2015 deadline uh, is, um, is, is, a little bit, is a little bit in question. At the federal level, there's not only the, there's, there's a bunch of actors. There's the FAA, which is trying to come up with, um, with, with rules, right? How do you modify the rules that govern the operation of aircraft to deal with unmanned aircraft? There's also a bunch of legislation. Um, legislation you know, mostly motivated by privacy interests. Um, so there's been a bunch of bills that were introduced at the federal level. None of them have been enacted, uh, at least so far. At the state level, however, it's a very different story. Um, in the 2013 unmanned aircraft bills, UAS bills, um, uh, not all addressing privacy, but mostly addressing privacy, were introduced in 43 states, a total of 130 bills. Bills were enacted in about a dozen states, including Texas, where we are right now. Um, and most of these bills address privacy with respect to government unmanned aircraft systems. A typical feature of these bills would be, uh, uh, re uh, uh, as, re would be as follows. It would say that if an unmanned aircraft has acquired imagery not pursuant to a warrant, that imagery cannot be used in a court of law. Okay. Now, the counterexample I always give is, well, hold on a second. Suppose you have uh, you know, law enforcement looking with an unmanned aircraft parked over. They're, they're looking at a traffic intersection where there's been some accident. They're just trying to monitor the traffic. Suppose on the sidewalk next to that intersection, there's a terrible assault that takes place. And you capture it on film. 
Would you, and you know who the assailant is. You, you see the guy, you see him getting into the car. Would you then tell the guy, well, you're, you're, you're free, it's okay. You know, it's okay to commit assault because we only caught it on the unmanned aircraft ca camera and so we're not allowed to use that. So you can think of a lot of, you know, you can, you can think of a lot of concerning examples that could arise when you have a blanket prohibition against, uh, against use of imagery. Now you can play the other side and say, well, if you're allowed to use all these ima images, what any images you want, you can say, well, let's play devil's advocate and see the bad things on the other side, then you know, maybe some people would go on fishing expeditions, right? So that's a, that's a concern on the, on the other side. So anyway, this is very, very active in the states. Uh, and you know, I've, I've provided some sites here, but, but it's, you know, I'm not going to try to go over all, all 43 states, but there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff going on uh, at, at the state level. Also, um, in terms of the integration here, uh, the FAA announced at the very end of last year the selection of six test sites around the United States, one of which is in Texas. And the FAA is, is very concerned, working very hard um, not to make sure they can integrate unmanned aircraft with manned aircraft, right? Because nobody wants, you know, everybody agrees with the importance of making sure that manned aircraft flight is not in any way endangered by unmanned aircraft flight. That would be really bad uh, if that were to happen. So to, to help figure all that stuff out, the, as part of that bill I talked about that was enacted in 2012, the FAA was mandated to establish six, six test sites throughout the United States. Um, the one that is perhaps most of interest in, in, in this room is the one that's in Texas. Um, it's being operated or will be operated by the Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. Uh, and and, and, and at, that actually consists of 11 sort of sites, I think scattered mostly around Texas, although maybe, maybe a few of them are outside of Texas. Um, and most of them, or half of them, are in the Big, big Bend region uh, of Texas. Um, and so that has actually uh, led to some controversy there, because th in that area, part of Texas, there are some groups that have raised concerns about you know, safety. Some of the, for example, the air rescue folks who operate out there have said, hold on a second, if there's, if there's unmanned aircraft flying around here, you know, I want to make sure that these things aren't going to come through my cockpit when I'm flying somebody to a, to a hospital. So anyway, the, these test sites are designed to figure out, to help the FAA and the rest of us learn how to integrate unmanned aircraft safely uh, in, into the airspace. Another really interesting development that just happened a few weeks ago, what happened was um, back in 2011, there was a guy named Raphael Perker, and he allegedly flew an unmanned aircraft and around the University of Virginia campus, kind of buzzing right over people's heads and things like that. And the FAA didn't like that. Um, and so the FAA then, uh, basically fined him $10,000, where they assessed a fine. They said, you have to pay, you violated uh, the, uh, the federal air regulations. It says, no person may operate an unmanned aircraft in a careless or reckless manner so as to endanger the life or property of another. They assessed a civil penalty of $10,000. Perker challenged the fine, and he won, at least so far. In March 2014, an NTSB um, administrative law judge ruled against the FAA, dismissed the fine, and said that the definition of aircraft did not apply to the unmanned aircraft that he's using, and that the FAA didn't have a basis for applying the regulation addressing careless or reckless aircraft operation. So this has, this has completely thrown a wrench into the sort of steady, plodding pace of the FAA's uh, treatment of this. The FAA appealed the ruling right away, so that stayed, that stayed it. So right now everything's kind of frozen. Uh, but it is an open question uh, what the court, uh, or what in this case the NTSB, which is the, the, the venue for adjudicating this, what the NT NTSB will do. Very, very interesting question. Um, and let me just um, mention a couple of other things. You know, the, 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 the drone discussion is, elite, well, the, Overseas, it's, it, people talk about the, the questions about you know, weaponized drones. But in the United States, the drone discussion is dominated by the privacy aspects, people discussing privacy. And again, as I mentioned before, it's a legitimate question. But that's not the only question. There's an airspace safety issue, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of discussion, um, not as much in the sort of public sphere, but among you know, groups with a particular interest in airspace safety, about making sure that unmanned aircraft don't cause problems from a safety standpoint. So there's, there's some groups, and I won't read them here, but various airline pilots groups and, and folks like that that have raised concerns about the potential impact of unmanned aircraft on manned flight safety. Uh, and the advocates of unmanned aircraft counter that, what's called sense and avoid, right? So the, in, um, in traditional manned aviation, there's a see and avoid responsibility for pilots to basically know what other traffic or, or do their best to know what other traffic is around and obviously avoid colliding with that traffic. 
With unmanned aircraft, the corresponding capability is sense and avoid. And so the question is, is it possible to design methods and technologies and algorithms strong enough to be successful at this? And it's a really important, complex, interesting problem, how you actually sense other traffic and, and or interact with it, and, and also the, the relative responsibilities of the different parties in the airspace and who controls them. So people, so it's, it's an area of tension. And that's why the FAA has these six, set, six test sites, including the one uh, that, you, that Texas A&M Corpus, Corpus Christi uh, is going to uh, look at. The, the last kind of high level topic I'll mention is, is there's also national security questions that get raised by unmanned aircraft. Um, unmanned aircraft obviously aren't stopped by the, you know, if you look around you know, the world, there's a lot of infrastructure that's in place to stop people from going where they're not supposed to go, right? And that infrastructure can be largely circumvented if you could just fly right over it. Um, that's always been possible. You can, you know, airplanes aren't new, but unmanned aircraft make it easier for someone to fly something uh, where they're not supposed to. Um, so most people agree that there's some risk that an unmanned aircraft could be used to launch some sort of attack, um, but there's a lot of disagreement with respect to the significance of that risk without, with respect to other risks uh, and what, if any, steps should be done to take it, uh, to address it. So in closing, a couple of uh, quick um, comments here. So just sort of higher level stuff. Um, privacy in context, I mean, I think, uh, you know, um, unmanned aircraft privacy is a really important legitimate concern. Um, and, you know, it's, we, it's very interesting in the sense that, that it's the way the technology is growing is very different from something like internet and mobile phones. So the internet and mobile phones grew as fast as their underlying technology enabled. Uh, and, and, they really, and, and as everyone knows, the internet and mobile phones raise enormous number of privacy concerns. Right? There's all sorts of privacy issues that happen thanks to the internet. But the result of the fact that the benefits of the technologies like the internet and mobile phones were well, were well understood by everybody meant that the privacy debate, when it occurred, was occurring among people who already understood the benefits of these technologies. Right? By contrast, with unmanned aircraft, we are having the privacy debate before we've had a lot of access to the benefits. We haven't had a lot of people rescued with search and rescue, right? We haven't had a lot of, of successful you know, forest fires fought, forest fires identified, um, hostage situations mitigated, and so on. The, the, all of these things are in the future, yet the privacy debate uh, is, is happening now. So that's a real difference with respect to how the debate is being handled, and it, and it, and it, it, it leads to the temptation to over-regulate uh, in, in advance. So, you know, again, a personal view here is it's certainly important to, to proactively consider how to protect against the risks on, in an unmanned aircraft. Um, in doing so, it's really important to recognize really the, the near impossibility of predicting all the different ways that a technology can be used, either for good or for ill, uh, in the future. And I think that that perspective will be uh, good for, uh, important for, uh, for, for um, ap good policy outcomes. And then finally, I'll just, you know, close by saying, um, you know, as with any technology, you know, it's, it's just incredibly difficult to figure out, to, to know where this goes. Today, when, you know, before, you before you attended this talk, you probably have thought of a drone as something that looked like a global hawk or a predator. Now you've seen it, one that looks like, you know, an insect and weighs one three hundredth of an ounce. You know, what happens when they weigh one one hundredth that uh, again? Um, it's really very, very hard to predict the future, other than to say it's going to have a lot of uh, you know, surprises and, and go in places that we couldn't possibly have imagined. So anyway, that's a, uh, that's, that's a good place to sort of stop and take questions. If anyone wants to suffer through a 60-page law review article, that's it. Um, but uh, <laughs> if anyone, I'm happy to uh, take some questions if there are any. Yes, sir. I think the next step, both militarily and civilian-wise, is method and means either to counteract the drone in other words, a drone that's going to knock down a military drone. I'm sure they're working on that. But I would also think that there would be methods, electronical, otherwise, that are being developed to counteract the observation capabilities of current drones. I mean, that's a really, so for, I'll, I'll put aside the military side, because that's not something I, I know, know much about. But on the domestic side, it's true, but we'd have to be careful with the consequences. So counteracting, some people may have read there's a town in Colorado that has talked about you know, issuing permits to shoot down drones. Um, <laughs> now, now, obviously, that's a very bad idea because you know the, you could end up shooting something that's not the drone. Um, and, and you know, the challenge with things like electronic jamming is, yeah, you might be able to figure out some way to jam the you know, to jam the signals to a drone. But but suppose that in doing that, 
you screw up cell phone coverage in the area, or you jam you know, some sort of security system, or you make it so your neighbor can't open their garage door, right? So, so there's, there's, you know, there's, before you start kind of trying to jam stuff, I, I think that there's, there's going to be a lot of concerns. So I don't think, I don't think we'll see anti-drone technologies marketed to the general public uh, anytime, anytime soon. Let me get this gentleman and this gentleman. Yes, sir. What about the drone that never flies over your property that has the camera that can look into your property? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's, so what, yeah, one of the other. So, 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 great question. We talked about that uh, a lot. So, you could. Ar we can have this argument or discussion about how how high above your property you control your property, right? And you could maybe even get an answer. But even if you get that answer, that doesn't stop somebody from, as the gentleman said, from parking over the public street and then looking obliquely, right? Uh, in, into your into your backyard. I mean, you 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 are you, you don't really have the ability to stop them. You as an individual don't have the ability to tell them they can't fly over the public street. The the only sort of counter I'd give to that is that if in doing that they look into your house in an invasive way, then I still think there's invasion of privacy issues you know, that could be that could be raised. What about the you know the telephoto lenses that the paparazzi used? Uh, to get, yeah, I mean it's a, it's a it's a real concern. I mean I mean you know and again uh, I don't have the answer to it. Although um, you know well first of all there's a couple there's a couple of things. First of all celebrities have a there's a different expectation of privacy that you have if you're I mean le from a legal sense not only kind of you know culturally but there's a different legal expectation of privacy that a public figure has than you know people 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 like us and so we have a higher uh, expectation of privacy uh, and I think again if someone used a telephoto lens in a way. Um, to that got images that were violating privacy, then that would be a problem. I should also say that not all images that infer, it, not all information that infers it, uh, activities in your home violate your privacy. For example, if you're, if I'm walking down the street and I'm walking by houses, and at, at the moment I'm walking by, a light goes off in one of the houses. Just somebody turned a light off. Did I violate their privacy? Of course not, right? I mean, I'm just walking down the street and they happen to turn their light off. And even though I happen to know that someone inside that house flipped the light switch at you know, 10, 14 p.m. So, uh, so I think the, the subject to those kind of calibrations, I think you could still address the, the, f f the oblique flight thing. But it's a complicated question. Somebody had, yes, sir. Do you see some <laughs> potential in, in um, Fourth Amendment protection by narrowly defining <coughs> purposes for, of, of drone use? Now, I'm thinking as an analogy, the courts finally ruled that the TSA could not detain you unless you had something on your person that would impair the safety of a flight. They couldn't, they couldn't detain you if you had too much money, too much cash, or drugs, or something that was otherwise not related to airplane safety. Likewise, could you say that if a police want to monitor, say, a sporting event with, 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 for, for security purposes, and it sees a house in a neighborhood with marijuana, the ruling is, well, that was outside the scope of that surveillance purpose for that, for that mission, <coughs> therefore that's, that evidence shouldn't be admissible. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's an interesting question, but let me just sort of counter by saying, and if that same sports observation on my aircraft sees an assault in the parking lot, mm -hmm. is that also sheltered? Well, you could argue it's part of the security of the, of the venue, but something that's completely unrelated to that <laughs> role. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it could be another crime. Right, but that would have to be a legislative. You, know, you, you can't sort of wake up and declare that's what the Fourth Amendment means because that the Fourth Amendment isn't that specific. But you could arguably do that. I mean, the, the challenge I've seen, and, and may, it may be worth considering. The challenge I've seen with these things is when you start thinking out the things. I mean, suppose it's suppose it's not security of the venue, but somebody, you know, somebody runs a red light at 70 miles an hour and kills somebody in an intersection two streets away from the venue. Right, that had nothing to do with the security for the venue. Would we want to exclude that evidence? You know, make a good argument that you want to have access to them. I think this gentleman here had a question. Uh, plane has a, uh, is the, uh, has to have be licensed to fly, uh, same as a car, or whatever. So why does it doesn't apply to a drone? It, it, it's a great question, and here's the answer. If I take my 10-year-old kid out to the city park and want to fly a helicopter that's this big, should I have to get the FAA's permission to do that? I mean, of course not. Right, uh, and that, so the challenge is. I mean, I, I don't think anyone doubts that if you can have a, a level where if you're flying above a certain height, you, you, I mean, that, that will at least respond to the, the worries of the pilots of uh, being hit by it. It will respond to some of the worries, but but um, so pilots. Um, in fact, the FAA already. Under the existing rules, uh, I mentioned law enforcement can fly unmanned aircraft under certain conditions, and that's limited to 400 feet. You have to be below 400 feet. 
Um, but it would, wouldn't re resolve all the issues. So uh, helicopters don't have minimum altitude requirements. Um, in fact, and also airplanes are allowed to go below minimums when they're taking off and landing. So it would, it would resolve some of the issues, but certainly not. So today, if I fly my drone, I, I, I'm totally legal? No, I, I never said that at all. No, not at all. I mean, um, so first of all, just, you know, so commercial flight, the FAA's position um, is that commercial unmanned aircraft use is not permitted in the United States. Now, there are those who challenge that position, including this, this case that I mentioned, but the FAA's position is that. So I personally would rather be conservative. I'm going to assume the FAA is right on that. Um, hobbyist um, flight uh, is uh, permitted, but only within limits. You can't you take your unmanned aircraft and fly it in the approach path of Hobby Airport and say, hey, man, I'm a hobbyist. You can't touch me. Um, you know, that would be ridiculous, right? So, so um, if you're a, a model aircraft hobbyist flying at an approved flying field, then that, that, is, that is permitted. But there's uh, nothing that really legislate that so far. So it's basically your own. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't agree that there's nothing. I mean, the FAA's position is that there's reckless and careless operation under the FAR Part 91, the, the air regulations. And, and that, that would be the government's position. And I, I think the government does have a right to stop reckless aircraft operation. Yes, sir. So, so you suggested that right now policy is getting ahead of practice. So I'm curious if you think that we need to wait for practice to catch up to policy, a rare event, or whether you think that we can build broader policy frameworks now, be more inclusive, less inclusive. Well, what's your policy prescription? I mean, well, if I had all the answers, I guess I'd be, uh, I'd be writing the legislation right now. I don't have all the answers, but I, I, I worry a little, mu you know, pe people have different agendas, right? And, and if your agenda is protecting privacy, which is a very worthwhile, laudable, important agenda, but if that is your goal, you might be less concerned is in if, in doing so, you happen to hamper some of the uses that don't, in fact, involve any privacy concerns, right? So you might be less concerned about collateral damage. And so the, the challenge is the stakeholders, we don't have a full, all the stakeholders aren't yet at the table, and the ones that are don't necessarily represent the full spectrum of legitimate uses of the technology. Now that's true in lots of that's true in lots of applications, but like I said, it's particularly true in this field. It's much more that that imbalance is much more true in this field than in other fields because we have this regulatory uh, delay, or, you know, because they aren't they aren't uh, allowed yet. By contrast, like I said, the internet example, everybody we all learned about the internet privacy concerns as we were all learning about the incredible benefits that the internet could bring. And so that dialogue was conducted with a better sense of, of benefits. That's what we're missing here. But I don't have a perfect answer for that. I really don't. Other than to cite the importance of these perspectives and the difficulty of, pr of predicting how these technologies are going are to go. This gentleman and then some of you. Yeah. With respect to the very small vehicles that were should have been hooked up, how much weight does a camera, a GPS, and a signaling system back to somebody, how much weight are those machines capable of carrying that kind of a system? How much weight? The, the, the Nano Hummingbird I showed you, the two-thirds of an ounce, had a camera and a wireless transmission capability. Okay? That RoboBee that weighs one three-hundredth of an ounce did not. Um, but um, you know, technology has a way of, 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 of making stuff that wasn't possible before possible. So at the very least, we're in the sub-ounce range today. Right? And if you take the, the you know, the, the improvement curves for technologies traditionally, it, it's not going to be surprising if it gets much smaller than that. Um, and, and you know, these, these small things aren't bad. You can imagine after a natural disaster, it would be very nice to have, you know, something this big that could go into, through cracks and, and damaged structures and see if there's anybody inside needing rescuing, for example, right? So there's lots of good applications you can think of for things like that. Uh, the gentleman here in question. Yes, sir. My question is to follow up on Dan's thing about policy being ahead of practice. You had a slide of a lot of really cool potential things we'd go do with drones. I do. If you can't do it commercially, then none of those can happen. I don't think hobbyists are going to go out and help power line people go inspect power lines and insulators and things, you know, several hundred feet up off the ground just because. And even if they did, they wouldn't be hobbyists anymore. Bingo. Right. I, I, I'm, not def I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not defending. The, I want there to be these commercial applications enabled. So um, what's it going to take to make that, to make those sorts of changes in the policies? Well, the rules originally for that, that that's, that's less a, at this point it's a implementation question. Under the uh, FAA Modernization and Reform Act of 2012, the FAA was supposed to be issuing rules for, commer for commercial small unmanned aircraft systems, 55 pounds and less, August this year, a couple months from now. 
That's been pushed back now, it looks like, till sort of November. Um, but there is a lot of pressure on the FAA to do that. And you know, whether, whether it will happen in August, it's almost certainly not going to happen in August, but it'll probably happen, you know, let's call it within, within nine months or a year. So that, that is going to happen. There's an enormous amount of pressure, generally healthy, on the FAA to, to do this. You have to, you have to also keep in mind, though, it's a difficult position to be in, right? If they go too slow, they get criticized justifiably for impeding the growth of this industry. If they go too fast and something happens, they will get criticized justifiably for being hasty, right? So it's a really, really delicate you know, position they're in. But yeah, I think there's an I think there's an enormous commercial potential, and I, 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 I you know, I think we should be we should get moving, and I think there's ways to do it. You don't have to solve the problem at 6,000 feet to make it possible to do crop spray, right? At you know, at, at 30 feet. Yes, sir. So no, I'm sorry. I get, let, let me <coughs> let me let me get go, go, ahead, go ahead and then we'll get you. Yeah, go ahead, gentleman in the front here. Yeah. Uh, as of last summer, under the Texas drone law, we already have policy here in the state of Texas. And it, a large part of that is the limitation of private citizens in using drones, whereas in a lot of other states, it's a limitation of the government using drones on private citizens. Texas has both, if I understand correctly. And the, the Texas law has, has both. But among the Texas, uh, my understanding, and I, it's dangerous to say this in a room full of folks in Texas, because you may know more than me, but I thought that among the other provisions, I, I th the Texas law had that provision about warrant, you need, you know, needing a warrant. And then secondly, I think the Texas law has provisions about needing permission of property owners before, uh, before filming. Um, you know. Texas law also has a carve out for institutions of higher education. The Texas law has a bunch of carve outs. And yes. it's, it's, got, it's got dozens of carve outs. Because what happened is when it was going through the Texas legislature, all these people who might be adversely impacted said, oh, if you're going to pass this, at least don't you know, make it so my organization can't do this. And so there's a bunch, bunch, of, bunch of these carve outs. A gentleman in the back, yeah. Yeah, and so John, put, put your futurist, futurist hat on for a minute. And so if, um, you know, around the time of World War II, there was this kind of idea that it was possible that there would be an airplane in every garage, every, you know, this sort of um, radically democratic vision of sort of aviation that would be available to sort of every man, right? And that doesn't happen, right? So most of us right. fly commercially, just a handful of folks who fly private, but I mean, that number's been declining precipitously over the, over the last decade. So right now, there's this moment where kind of everyone wants their own drone, right? And, and, and there's this idea that, you know, everyone should sort of go to Amazon and, and, and land one. And I'm curious what you think about that, the prospects of that kind of consolidation, uh, yeah. sort of more, you know, or whether this is something that it's cheap enough, it's easy enough to use, that actually everybody's going to have one. I don't, think, I don't think everyone will have their own drone. I don't even think that everyone wants their own drone. I think, you know, um, you know, some people like me and maybe you move in a circle where people talk about these things, but most people just don't want to be bothered. And, and so, so I, I don't think we're going to head to that. I, I would also, I guess, would say that all of us, I mean, there, we're different ages in this room, but all of us are, are living in this, 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 you know, the idea that airplanes carry people in the cockpit is in some sense a historical aberration. It's just true for the hundred or so years that includes when we have lived. Right, um, and and so you know before 190, you know early 1900s, there were no airplanes, and 100 or 200 years from now, it will be the default assumption that most unman or most aircraft are unmanned. Right, we just happen to have grown up in a world where aircraft were manned, and that chapter in history is closing. And I think we're going to see. So I think the futurist aspect of it is is not that everyone's going to have their own personal drone, but that these things are going to be used in ways. Um, that that you know, for society, will do things that were really you know unimaginable. But I, I don't see I don't see the thing where like you arrive at Rice University. Oh gosh, I forgot my lunch. Let me just push a few buttons and my, my drone my drone will go back and get it. You know, I, I think what you'll do is just go to the cafeteria and buy lunch. Yeah. Are the safety concerns from pilots are legitimate when we have self-driving cars that you know? Can, we realize that the sensors and the cameras are more reliable than human intervention. I think the self. I think. I think. Well, I think the safety concerns are legitimate because you know, if you think about it from the pilot standpoint, you know, it, it only takes one, right? And there's a lot of cowboys out there, right? There's a lot of folks who are just going to be, you know, um, who, who might be, you know, might not be careful. So, um, so I, I think it's a legitimate. I think it's a legitimate. It can. It can be overblown, but it, it, you know, I, I would, you know. It, it would be a real issue if, if, a, if a, even a drone this big, right, if it comes through the windshield of a, of a plane, that, that, could be, that could bring it down. But, but that's <coughs> it. Uh, you, you mentioned that the FAA is completely resistant to autonomous uh, UAVs or UASs. So you know, wouldn't it be better to have more 
computerized sensors and sense and avoid than human inter human flying drones? I mean, you know, that's a broad question. Of sort of, are are computers better at doing you know tasks than humans? And you know, um, I, I don't I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think you can think of some cases where that's the case, um, but. Um, there are lots of cases where where pilots have made you know you know if you look at that uh, remember that plane that landed in the Hudson River a couple of years ago you know would a computer have made all those decisions as well as as, as, as the captain of that flight maybe not right and that's what it is in commercial flight we have the, a computer drive it essentially um, and the pilots there well but uh, let me counter by respectfully saying that it is true a lot of these things are by computer in commercial flights but the critical moments right I mean you know yes if you're at thirty six thousand feet going straight for an hour. We well, don't really need the pilot to do much except to sort of be there in case something goes wrong. But if you're landing, you know, in a thunderstorm, right? Um, you know, I, I think the pilots are very much on the job, uh, and, and and their skills are very much needed. So yes, sir. Um, I guess building off of that and having like self-driving cars, you would also maybe have like robots that would be able to be perceptive in some way using these like images. And I wonder if like we really want to wait until like some kind of situation arises, like. I'm thinking like of, of police drones that would maybe be able to perceive something about individuals uh, that would be beyond what like the naked eye could see. And, and are you advocating for it? Or are you asking? Do we want to wait until some kind of like because you're saying that policy is way ahead of like practice right now? But is this some situation do we necessarily want to wait until some kind of uh, situation arises, or do we want to set up a policy framework? Well, I mean, if we knew everything, if we were omniscient, then we would set up the right policy frame. But the question is, you know, um, what, what what that should be. Let me just, in closing, make a quick anecdote. There's a, a fellow I know um, who is the he's a works for a, for Mesa County Col Mesa County Sheriff's Office in Colorado. Very nice guy, and he's their unmanned aircraft pilot. And a little while ago, I was talking to him, and I said, you know, how, you know, how many missions have you thrown have you flown with your unmanned aircraft? And he said, I can't remember, it was thirty something. So how many times have you performed surveillance? He said zero, not once. I said, what do you use it for? We use it after the fact, arson investigations, crime scene investigations, and things like that. So, so you know, I, I think you know that's important perspective to keep in mind as well is that law enforcement certainly could include surveillance, including surveillance that would really raise some concerns. But it doesn't imply that it's necessarily surveillance. There's lots of very legitimate uses for, for law enforcement. Um, so, um, any other question? I think we may be time for maybe one more question. One more question. Yes, sir. So, I'm wondering if you know if you were looking for someone specific and you had this 15 mile radius <laughs> imaging technology that you showed, are there imaging algorithms that could pan through all these different images and search electronically using facial recognition or looking for a specific? The, the, yeah, there are, there are algorithms. I don't want to say they're perfect, but I, I guess you know what you, what you really are raising is this question of being tracked ubiquitously and, and the questions it raises, and I, and I don't claim to have the answers. I think it raises some very fundamental questions. But I would, the one thing I would say is that question is not unique to unmanned aircraft, right? There are surveillance cameras everywhere these days, right? Um, and you know, it is hard to go anywhere without being tracked on license plate cameras or surveillance cameras or have your cell phone track you everywhere you are. And so is there a legitimate question about whether you know, we should be literally tracked every single place that we go? Yes, there is a legitimate question. But that question is not one that is framed only by systems like this Argus. An important question, but if we're going to, so let me put it another way. If it's unconstitutional to do it with Argus, it should be unconstitutional to do it with any technology, right? It shouldn't matter whether the technology is on the ground or in the air. So that's a broader, more fundamental question. I don't claim to have the answer to that question. I just don't. Okay, yes, sir. Could you just flip back one slide so we can get the citation that that article you were? Um, well, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's probably easier than trying to write all that down. But Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, you can do a search. Is this guy, are we allowed to answer this guy's question? Okay, last one. I, I understand your, your policy topic is in the United States, and it pretty clearly seems that policy and civilian uses that make sense probably aren't going to happen here first. <laughs> I don't know how much research you do. Are there any other countries you can identify that face similar issues but seem to be further ahead in terms of making things work? Australia and Japan are two examples that come to mind of, of, of countries that have, I don't want to say they're farther ahead, but they've been more proactive in terms of, of unmanned aircraft you know, commercial uh, commercial use, um, and, and there are probably uh, others as well. But I, I, Australia and Japan are two specific examples where uh, commercial use, as far as I've told and understand, has, has, been, has been permitted. Okay. Well, thank, I would like to thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.